Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. And as usual, I always welcome my guests and it's with honor that I welcome Stephen because I know there's a couple of things on the onset that are very precious to someone when they come here. Time. Time is one of the most precious commodity. And I thank you for coming and sharing that uh, commodity here with us at Threads of Enlightenment. The other is your journey. It is housed with power. And it is a personal journey, and I am so glad that you're here to come and share it, that we may partake of it and learn together so that we can become better human spirits while we occupy this beautiful planet. Stephen, welcome to Threads of Enlightenment, sir. Thanks, Ken. It's good to be here. Excellent. I want you to tell them about your podcast. Tell them about all the things that you have, because I always say to them, Stephen, that creator will never stay stagnant. It is one of the things they don't know how to do once they have been uh, been awakened to their journey. So tell them what you have so far. <laughs> what I have to offer is my my knowledge and my experience that I've acquired from my journey. So the things that um, I've done right and the things that I've done wrong and the lessons that uh, that I've that I've gained from them. I, I like. Um, there's a there's a quote that I came across once. It said something like, "There there are some people who um, who learn from there's some people who learn from others' mistakes. There are some people who learn from their own mistakes. And there's a third group who don't even learn from their own <laughs> mistakes." Um, but I I certainly you know in my path I I have enjoyed interacting with other people who are also on also on seekers on a journey and who've learned and shared things with me. So in turn. Now at 55 years, I've been through all sorts of situations and circumstances. I've seen not everything, but many things. And so, um, the, it's something like this. The, the thing, the main thing that I would like to share, like if there's one thing, rather than trying to tell you like, oh, what are all the things that I want to share? What are all the things that I want to tell you? There could be many, many of them. But if I were to boil it down to one thing, like if somebody said like, what's the one, the most important thing that you, that you could share with others? Mm-hmm. I have that. And that is everybody has a unique nature. Everybody's, whether you call it a personality, who you are, your talents, Everybody's unique. Everybody has a unique nature. And when you understand what that is and you embrace that, then you're able to approach and take on all of the chaos, all of the challenges that life throws at you. You're able to take them on with greater ease and without, um, without as, as much fear or anxiety or stress. And so what I say is people go on journeys. I went on a really long journey, far journey to India and I'm in Cambodia. You don't have to go geographically far, but you have to go far inside. Yeah. And that distance is not... It's not acquiring something per se. It's not like additive. It's yes. actually removing. It's, it's subtractive. It's removing all of the programs and the conditionings and the yes. false beliefs and the, the ego trips and um, misassociation of, of, uh, you know, who we're not mm-hmm. getting rid of those things and just seeing who we are. So my main message is find out who you are and embrace that and everything becomes much easier. so that's like that's everything like if you t- can if you tell me like tell everybody everything <laughs> that's my everything right there yeah that's a powerful everything though so <laughs> um and it is my hope that um uh the one of the what, things that i like Stephen, is to have people like yourself because i want people to understand and hear the journey of everyone different people different uh, walks of life, but uh, it is my hope that they feel that they. I want them to know that they're not alone. That there are other people here that are experiencing things that they are experiencing. Uh, some of us have gone through. We may be a little further down the road than they are, and we have gained a few things. And if they are open and uh, uh, want to receive, as we have these conversations. It is my hope that something resonates within them to assist them to move them forward so that they don't have to stay an extra minute within that situation that they're in. As you stated, the goal is to uh, find and live from that space once you get there and then everything will become. I want you to talk to us 
Stephen about, I always uh, go back and we talk about some of the conditioning and some of the programming that we receive from our families and, and so forth, because these are the things that give birth to um, who we used to be. And now mm -hmm. some of these things that we have to unpack, as you said, unfold so that we can get to know who we truly are. Talk to me about your family upbringing and um, uh, let's start from there. Sure. Um, originally from New Jersey. And, and in Cambodia in, now. Uh, <laughs> now. Now I'm in Cambodia. <laughs> so I'm on the other side of the world now. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, no, I could never have imagined I would have here. But um, yeah, I grew up in, in New Jersey, in the suburbs, right out near, uh, outside New York City, maybe about 12 miles from the city. And um, mom, uh, my mom was into event planning. My dad mm -hmm. was a lawyer. Have an older brother who's a year yeah. and a half older. He also became a lawyer. He followed in my dad's my dad's footsteps. Um, because I didn't have that pressure, I, I decided to explore a little yeah. bit more. I was a little more deviant that way. And um, for me, I mean, you know, how do I tell the story? For me, there there are a few milestones or markers. One of them was like what my, my one of my first experiences that I remember was um, listening to a choir. Mm -hmm. And that was a very powerful experience for me. Like I can, I can just remember the music and the melodies and sort of like a spiritual atmosphere. That was something that, that was like embedded deep in my heart from, from the beginning. And the, the next, apart from like my normal upbringing, you know, just being a growing up in 70 or whatever, I would say the defining things for me that were really impactful when I went to summer camp. I had a counselor at the summer camp who um, who was really spiritual. He was aspiring to join the Seminole Indian tribe mm -hmm. um, in Florida, and he used to have all these books about you know Native American spirits. And I, yeah. I remember all the kids were outside like playing basketball and baseball and volleyball and all this stuff, and I'm there in in the bunk. With, mm -hmm. with these books that he had. And they, mm -hmm. they were like, as far as I, I can recall, they were like coffee table size books, yeah. big pages with like colorful, like spirit animals and all sorts of stuff. And I, I can just recall the, the charge that I got out of that while I was flipping through those, those pages. And, um, he was into meditation and, yeah. and, um, every day in the morning he would say, I'm going to meditate. And I never forget, like, Imagine I was like eight or nine years old. And this is way before the yoga craze and meditation. This is early, like this is mid seventies. And I would follow him like outside the bunk because before anybody got up, he must've gotten up like six in the morning. I would follow him outside and I would like spy on him. Like, cause I didn't know what he was going to do. I thought he was going to be like levit levitating or something. Right? <laughs> and so he would go to these, like there were these basketball courts and stuff where the sun, when it rose, that's like, it would shine there first. So it was a little bit yeah. warm there. This was in the Catskills in New York. So it was kind of cold in the morning, dewy and whatnot. And I, I used to just go and spy on him and watch what he was doing. He was just meditating and he was into martial arts and stuff like that. So I was really impressed. I was really impressed by him. Uh, his name is uh, Angel Marcano. That that's um, that was mm -hmm. his. And um, somehow that experience, I was eight or nine years old, that got me on this path of seeking something more meaningful. And he taught me all these ways of um, how you could draw energy from the earth and imagine yourself in an egg. And yeah. the color of the egg that you would imagine would give you different kinds of like red meant one thing and green meant another thing. Some would heal you, some would give you power and stuff like that. And there, there, it was like, where was this coming from? You know, here I am, like the, every other channel of knowledge, you know, it was like Scooby-Doo on TV yeah, yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. like you know, McDonald's and, you know, all sorts <laughs> of junk food and stuff like that. You know, like what kind of information knowledge were we getting? But this was coming from like, I said, like another planet. It was very rare for yes. somebody to, for like me to get that information. So that was like a second milestone for me in imbibing there was there was another way, another what do you say, uh, another way of experiencing the world that dealt mm. with energetics and spirit souls. And so that was the, the the next I guess milestone I would say. And then it happened to me again when I was in college. I started to read books. Mm -hmm. I was reading um, philosophy. I was reading Carlos Castaneda, and I started to read Carl Jung's Synchronicity. And then mm. at that time. I had some dreams uh, about Indian spirits, like the Indi from India, and yeah. that sort of led me on this path down to India. And, and I went there for not immediately, but I had gone. I went there for twenty-one years, so that sort of like led me down that. Wow, that's um, and that's really fun, uh, Stephen. Uh, uh, I've spoken to a couple of hundred people uh, with my podcast, and there's this theme 
that follows the uh, everyone that has embarked on their journey because most of the people that come have gone through theirs. And it is that chance meeting or that what they recall, you know, chance meeting, which I believe it is a, um, it was part of our path and, uh, how many of them are open to the spiritual realm earlier in their life. And as it, uh, as they, uh, grew and become, you know, adults, how that little, um, seed that was planted, how it grew within them and it was still able and powerful enough to pull them along and send them on this um, seeking path. And, and I'm hearing yours, and I'm thinking of a few people that, uh, mm. um, you know, have gone through that. And it is a powerful thing because I, I try to tell people, Stephen, we are all spiritual beings, um, energy housed within this body. And the programming and all of the, the other things is not truly who we are. So that's why it doesn't matter if someone achieve all of the natural things as wealth and all of the other things, education, the highest echelon of education. All of it doesn't satisfy that spiritual being unless it is spiritual food. And so it propels you. So I'm glad to hear your story. So here you are. I want you to talk to me as you're getting these dreams because that's really an interesting thing, Stephen, to mention, here you were with the American Indian input or seed that was mm. given birth within you, but your dreams were from mm. India, from a totally different part of the world. Yeah. What made, what, how did that transpire? How, what did you think caused that? Um, you know, because it's, it's still a spiritual journey, but it's basically two, two different location, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, first you ask yourself, like, what does this mean? What is this about? Why is this coming yeah. to me? Um, like, it's it's not like I had been, it's not like I'd been looking for it. And I was like getting something back. This just came like completely out of out of left field it was just coming different. And I, I started to ask questions. I'm like, who are these spirits? Who are these, uh, these names? And when I began to research and find out about it, then people said, yeah, this is what this means. And this is, um, uh, who, who this is and so on. So I started to fill in those, those gaps, fill in those details. Yeah. And I read a lot, talked to a lot of people who were from India, or at least who had, who had knowledge about traditional Indian, um, literature and mythology who could at least guide me in that path. But I'm the kind of person, you know, when I want to go for something, I go really deep into it. So it wasn't enough for me just to read about it. Like I wanted to go to the source. So yeah, eventually, yeah. um, I said to myself, all right, I'm, I'm going to go to India to find myself. And so, so that was a 21 year journey going. Back. That is awesome. I really turned so, over a lot of stones there until, <laughs> until I, sure. until I said, okay, there are no more stones to turn over. Okay. Let's, you, you got what you've need, you, you need. So then I could, then I could leave after. Excellent. So here you are. You've made this decision, Stephen, to, to make this uh, journey. And that's, uh, I, I tell people when you are beginning to hunger, um, once you, have made that decision. I think this is one of the reasons why people are um, in a stagnation mode. It's simply because they haven't made a decision yet. I think, I think the human uh, condition of who we are, the spiritual aspect of who we are, is that once we've made a, a decision, Stephen, I believe that um, we will do the corresponding uh, actions that are necessary to make it come to pass. And I always label that as your statement of yeah. faith. And the reason why I say that to people is that you have to believe it more than that, than anyone else. You, it's just such a part of you that you, you're like, I need to do this. And as a result of that statement that you make, you will then take the corresponding action. Yours is to buy a ticket, get on this plane, go to a country that you know nothing about as far as ever experiencing it. Talk to me as to when you get there, Stephen, when you are now. Uh, because I know some of uh, my friends have gone there, and I, I'm I'm planning on doing a trip there. But all of that changes, and all of that uh, now rushing into your senses. Talk to me about that, and how did you? What were your first steps once you got into the country? Well, the first thing that I want to say is, for me, once I started on on this path, it wasn't 
so much about making choices as much as it was uh, doors began to open up and there was almost mm-hmm. no choice. I, yeah. I don't mean that I was forced. I mean that a door would open and it's like, this is the door to go through next. Like, this mm-hmm. is where I go. And then something else would happen. And it's like, oh, this is the door I go through now. So yeah. to me, that that would define more of the path rather than coming to constant forks in the road and being stuck with decisions and not knowing which which way to go. Um so that said, um, there, there's just one experience that I wanted to share because I think it's it's appropriate. Right before I went to India, uh, mm-hmm. while I was reading about while I was reading about this, like what actually got me to India was um, I was I was still in that process of reading and discovering, and um, I got a job. I wanted to be a, a rock star, and I found out that aspiring rock stars don't make any money, so I had to get a job, mm-hmm. and I got a job in New York City. I got a job as a teacher. Yeah. Uh, and I started to teach and like in my first class, it sort of like struck me like a bolt of lightning, like the voice from the sky, like, you know, you're not a rock star, you're a teacher. <laughs> and that, that app, that really electrified me in that mm-hmm. moment, um, where everything lit up for me. And suddenly it's like, oh my goodness, this is what I, this is my calling. This is what yeah. I was meant to do. So it was pulling me forward. It was almost like a vacuum. It was like sucking me through this. And so after teaching quite a bit, I then, this is for about a year, taking on more and more teaching jobs and opportunities. Um, I decided that um, I thought, hey, why don't I, oh, I open up my own school? And mm-hmm. it was at that time that a friend of mine said, hey, I know some people in India. Why don't, why don't you open up your school in India? That could be really cool. And then I was like, yeah. oh my God, because I'd been studying about it. And then it was like, of course, like that's yeah. what to do. And that's when I took my my first trip there. So I made three trips over like three years. I made three mm-hmm. visits there in the planning, like, okay, what's this going to be about? And what am I going to do? Yeah, and yeah. it was during that time I did some trekking. I went up into the I went up into the mountains. I went into the Himalayas. I I met I met some of those guys who live in the in the caves. <laughs> they're not they're not always they're not always like what you what you think. Like sometimes they're just guys who are in caves, and that's all. Yeah. Um, but um, I did meet a number of people who were very inspiring and influential in my in my deeper understanding. And um, well, it was. India is pure chaos. That's like the first thing that you need to understand. When you yeah. go to India, it brings you, it's a country like no other that I would say brings you in confrontation with yourself. It really holds the mirror up to you. And that for some reason, because of the way the country is structured, whatever mm-hmm. that is, it's a unique spot on earth. Um, when you're, when you're confronted with so much chaos like that, um, you have nothing to hold on to except what's inside. Yeah. And so if you've got a lot of baggage, <laughs> you are not, um, you're not okay with yourself. That stuff comes right to the surface. Um, you, you got like uh, mommy issues <laughs> or you've got some, you know, uh, something you're repressing. All that stuff just comes flying out. And, um, well, it did for me. And so like I started to see those things and deal with those yeah. things, but that's also part of the, the growth aspect you know when you when you clean something uh the first thing that happens is stuff gets dirtier right you put yes, soap yes. down you put water it, like it all gets like brown and starts like getting yeah. dirty but do you, you have to do that um in order to clean in order to like purify it so there was a lot of that um you know i got there there was first thing like no power power cuts yeah. and then it gets to be like 115 118 and there's no power and then you know then there's mosquitoes on top of that <laughs> so you're like Lying on the top of a roof with no power, uh, you know, in the middle of the night and just being eaten alive by mosquitoes. And you're like, what the hell am I doing here? Um, But then you have to ask yourself, I had to ask myself a question, are you okay? Can you, can you be with this and be okay? And that was just one example. There were many circumstances that I had to face to face with in terms of personal relationships and, um, you know, betrayal, people who would cheat me or, um, you know, there were all sorts of challenges that I I had to face over the years and um, temptation. So you start, as you go through each of those experiences, I, as I, let me speak personally, as I went through each of those experiences, um, I would find out more of who I really was underneath all of that brought me face to face with those with those aspects of myself who who I really understood myself to be what my values were what my values are 
how I live into them. And so for me, that, that, that was really much of the process of the, it's, um, there's a, um, a, an image of, of, um, burning away. Like you'll see a lot of sacrifices in India, like people mm-hmm. with fires and they're like doing sacrifice sacrifices all the time. And so what that's representative of is the burning away of misconceptions of ourself, of attachment yeah. to certain things. You know, this life is transient. It's very temporary. The more we're attached to things in this material world, the more frustrated we're going to become because we lose them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, can't make use of them. Um, you know, stuff comes and goes, people come and go. So the more you're attached to those things, then the more you're, you'll be frustrated. So there's this process, there's this ritual of like, you know, burning things, which, which is like giving up and letting go. So for me, that was like, it took me 21 years to really let go of a lot of stuff until the point where it was like, I mean, I'm not finished, obviously. Yeah. It's like, maybe it's more like, you know, you have a fan and you turn mm-hmm. the fan off. So like, maybe my fan has been turned off, but the fan's still spinning, you know, so <laughs> it's like winding. It's at least not speeding up now. It's like winding down. That's like a better, better way to put it. It's still spinning. I'm still getting rid of some of my attachments. But yeah, um, I think yeah. for me, like that's, that's what the, what the, the, the experience was largely about. Yeah. I, I, the reason why I, I came to that question, because I know talking to, my brother, he goes there almost every year and I have a couple of close friends and I'm planning on getting there as well, as, as I mentioned. It is a place that, um, uh, my brother, uh, we are from the West Indies and the closest thing he, he, he could use to, um, to bring the imagery to me was, he's like, uh, you're being dropped in this pressure cook. And he said, if you yeah. are, um, it question, you question everything with, if you're not coming there with an open mind, you will break. Is what he is yeah. said because it will challenge everything that the Western civilization deemed important and, uh, in their survival. And when you get there, you realize there's no such thing. You have to find another way to survive. And that's when you start looking in, inwards as to the reality, as to who you are, what is important yeah. in that, uh, new world that you're a part of when you're coming from someplace where um, you have access to everything, electricity, things that, uh, in the Western civilization you take is granted as, uh, uh, you know, it's just there. Yeah. And you realize that no, it's not just there. It's, it's, and so he said it's being in that and you're put in a space where you have to face your demons quickly. And he said it's not, yeah. it's, it's not like, you know, you go to some other countries and you're able to lay around a little. He's like, no, you have to face this day one. Once you get there, you face it with the traffic. You face it with everything. And uh, he said it's a beautiful, painful journey, but it's, you know, he recommend anyone, my brother Mark said, I recommend anyone who wants to grow personally quick to get over there and spend a couple of years. They will lose their mind and grow fast. But here you are. I love that um, that you're there. And the reason why I pointed you to that question and also, Stephen, was I wanted you to talk about some of those uh, things that you have to face because we all have to face those programmings that we have been instilled with. You talked about broken relationships and all of these different things. This is where some of the people are, are stuck and they don't know how to move beyond that. And they get into a space of hatred and, and all of the other, uh, uh, as you said, the mud. Um, talk to me, uh, um, Stephen, as to how did you move through the mud? I know you mentioned it yeah. briefly, but talk to them yeah. as to how to move through some of this mud because th- the mud is there, you know? Yeah. So there there are a couple of things around this. Like one of the first things that I found when I got there, you know, I went to India and I'm looking for this spiritual thing when I get there. I'm like, you know, <laughs> show me the enlightenment, you know, show me the spiritual thing. I'm here. I'm ready. Give it to me. And I'm looking for, I'm looking for that thing. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so when I, I'm like that, I'm in that mode. People would constantly be coming up to me and they would start talking spiritual things and they would, they would do like a, almost like a spiritual flexing. You know, yeah. people would, would try to demonstrate to me or prove to me how spiritually advanced they were. You know, yeah. they wanted to impress me. Mm-hmm. And those could be spiritual people, you know, otherwise spiritual people, you know, like yogis or gurus and that kind of yeah. thing, or they could be somewhat normal. And the more I would spend time with them, with these people, the more, the more that they spoke about it, 
right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the more I would like spend time with them, the more I would find out they were full of BS. <laughs> You know, I would go to ashrams and yeah. you would think that like, I'm going to have this ashram experience going to be so incredible. And I would get there. And like, if you're just coming to an ashram for like, you know, a day or two days or something, it's one thing. If you stay there for a couple, like a couple of weeks or a couple yeah. of months, then suddenly you find out everybody is like, just about everybody is, is weird and has <laughs> like issues. And th it's, oh, it's like they are they are worse than most of the people that I found in, in other parts of life or other areas or other domains who are just going through life normally and are decent people. Yeah. I found the most unkind, inhumane people the further I got into places that claimed themselves to be spiritual. And every, yeah. it was just about every spiritual guru that I met, the more I was there, the more the controversies would start coming out. Mm -hmm. So yes. I would find, you know, they would be preaching celibacy, but then after hours, you would yeah. find all these stories in here, like everybody, and then you, everything would start to spill out. And then you would find, find out about all the garbage that was going on there. I mean, there were places, there were people when I got in and other people pulled me aside and they said, you know what, stay out of there because this guy's involved with land grabbing, murder, um, you know, embezzlement, you, you name it, this whole wow. litany of, of things going on. I was like, what? <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I thought people yeah. were lying to me. And then the more I would like kind of go into those situations and I, I would start hearing it from other people. They're like, just, yeah, yeah man, just stay away. Just, you have no idea. Um, and I heard even conversations about some of that stuff. And I was just like, this is, this is like messed up. I, I have to get out of here. So, so talk about mud. Um, I'm going there trying to find some like greater good. And the crazy thing is listening to people justify the most heinous and BS kind of things because it's for yeah. God or because it's for, yeah. and that to me was probably the biggest, whether you call it a letdown or the, the biggest, um, mind blower, the biggest yeah. mind blower for me, the place that I'm going to for this sort of enlightenment. And you go into the places that look like, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, <laughs> right? So looking for spirituality and all, it's like the place that's got the signboard outside. This is the place where you're going to get enlightenment. <laughs> And you go there and that's, that's where you lose all your money and they yeah. take everything away from you or, you know, so, um, so I would say like, that was the, that was the, um, the, the biggest takeaway. And the other thing, I mean, talking about like the mud is when you leave one situation and there's somebody who throws you a line and they're like, listen, it's not that it's something else. You, you grab onto that and that winds up being its own, own source of mud and mud, BS yeah. and whatever. So I kept finding that the more that I would keep looking for it in other people or in other locations or organizations or forms of meditation, yoga, religion, diets, blah, blah, yeah. blah, the more it was, it was like one massive letdown after the other. And that's why it took me 21 years. Maybe I'm a slow learner, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm, because... I'm in that third category. The guy who doesn't learn from his own mistakes. <laughs> Even though I'm laughing because I was in an ashram too. I was listening to oh. your story and I was like, that is so funny because, um, yeah, it, it is a interesting place to, um, to seek spirituality. And um, in many ways, it's contrary to what it's about. And so I had to dig inside myself. And so mm -hmm. I was looking, as you said, you were looking every place else. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm walking in, in it. I'm, it's me. It's, it's, you know, so I started looking in. So talk to me uh, because I'm laughing, Stephen, because I know exactly what, what that feels like. So what, Talk to me as to when you realize that, wait a minute, I don't, I don't need that. I, it, I have to sit down with Stephen and begin to look in, inwards to begin to unfold, uh, who am I amongst all this BS that yeah. I'm hearing and just this mud that is all up to my throat right now. How do I get out of there? What was the incident that caused you to go boom? Yeah, that was my, that was my rock bottom. That was mm -hmm. when I had enough. So, you know, I eventually found people that I, that I started to work with who I thought were like, I thought they were the most 
um, reasonable people out of like yeah. all these other people that I met. As I said, like I went from one place to the other sort of like looking and, um, I thought they were the most reasonable and we did, we were working together and we were doing business together and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and at one, at one point, um, when in the business, when the money started to come and the business started to grow, I suddenly found out that shares that had been allotted to me were never mm -hmm. registered. Wow. And I just said to myself, Oh my God, tell me oh, that they wow. didn't do that. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was like, you know how I finally found people who I thought I could believe in, and and then they pulled they pulled a like a, a fast one that was that was so um, you know jaw dropping. That's like mm -hmm. that's the best way. It was it was just a massive betrayal, and it was at that point that I I guess in a way it was like I lost all faith in following some kind of a faith or some sort of organized because they justified everything with some religious yes. spiritual religious. connotation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said to myself, like, <clears throat> it was interesting because I thought about, um, I thought about something that the Dalai Lama said, which was somebody asked him about what he believed in. He said, listen, what I, what I believe in, like my belief of God, he said, that's between me and God. Mm -hmm. He said, but what's important for you and, you know, to know is how I deal with you and how I deal with the world. He said, me and God, that's our connection. He said, otherwise, I'm one of 7 billion people and I have yeah. to be compassionate and kind and so on and so forth with everybody that I deal with. And so I thought about that very deeply at that time, which is, which is that, um, you know, for me, this was my, you know, my learning, which is putting faith in any kind of organized, this is for me. Yeah. Any kind of like organized structure like that, where there are people who are maintaining it, people are people and everybody is human. Everybody is just a human being. Like you said, you said it very rightly before that we're, we're all similar. We're all going through the same thing mm -hmm. just because somebody might be quote unquote, uh, you know, in a, in a privileged position in a way, they might be a leader, they might be a teacher, they might be, you know, something like that does not give them any greater right, power, value than ev like the Dalai Lama's. Everybody is the same. Everybody is equal at the end of the day. And yeah. so for me, what I realized is that, um, I'm nobody, I'm nobody special. I've got these qualities. This is who I am. This is what my values are going to be. How kindly I deal with whoever it is that, that I interact with. If by some, if by some reason I'm given some stewardship or I'm given some kind of position where other people are dependent on me, I can never forget. I should never forget, never look down on somebody else, never yes. judge somebody else yes. like this, because I heard them saying that, you know, we, we are part of this elite and we, we have to be together. And, you know, Steve has his own ideas and, you know, we're the ones who are with God and th that kind of stuff. When I heard that kind of discussion and that sort of thing, I real, and, and all of the, uh, all of the wrong that they were doing, then mm -hmm. I, it was like my point where I realized that, I have to stop looking for all of that outside and expecting others to, to hold that for me or to, no. Um, I just have to be a normal guy with his feet on the ground and, um, do good to other people, be compassionate. It doesn't mean I have to be stupid and it doesn't, I have to protect myself. Yes. But if ever I'm given a position of, where somebody is dependent on me, I have to be so careful not to take advantage of that person. Yes. Because it becomes so easy to when you gain power or you have money or you've got some kind of situation where, where people hold you in regard. I've seen how easily people can, um, can, how that can, can, um, cause people to, to misbehave and to abuse and to exploit. So yeah. to me, like that was my rock bottom where I made a vow to myself, like, I'm never going to be that person. And, um, and so, like, that's, that's where it all came home to me. I think um, people like that, to me, they haven't really been on the journey of loving the self. Because I think at that place of loving the self, learning to love the self, um, because I'm, I was my biggest critic, I was my biggest enemy, I was my biggest whatever, my monsters, there was nothing like me. But when I started loving me and falling in love with me and learning to be empathetic and learning to be kind and learning to be forgiving f towards me, Stephen, not, not towards anyone else. I mean, 
first I had to learn how to, how to, uh, experience that for myself so that when I am in a position where I have to have other people, um, you know, are looking up to me or so forth, that when I look at them now, I can love them. I can be empathetic. I could be, uh, not judgmental because I've learned how not to judge myself. I know how painful it is when I judge myself. And so I don't want them to feel that way as how I feel. So I am able to, to do those things. And I think a lot of so-called leaders and all these people haven't really, uh, um, had that experience and it's yeah. visible on how they treat people. And it, it, Absolutely. as soon as I see it, Stephen, I run because I know that they are not being honest with themselves. And if they are not exactly. being honest with themselves, they will never be able to be honest with me. And it's, it's something that you can yeah. see. And, ex- and once you see it, um, I know that they are not there and I don't want to be in that because I'm just uh, collateral damage within their yeah. space. Um, I had a friend of mine, we, we went to see the Dalai Lama. We had an audience with him and, and someone comes up to him and, you know how people, when they get in that space, they get all spiritual and stuff like that. And they, I love his wisdom. He, they, they ask him, what is the meaning to life? And he looks at them and he says, stop that nonsense. He said, what is, <laughs> he looked, he said, what is your life? What is the meaning to your life and towards the world? How do you feel towards this person and that person? What is your meaning? The meaning and he pointed right back to them and yeah. most of us it's right um, here it's right yes, here it's not it's, like it's, some it's, crazy big wild thing outside somewhere outside else. and so everyone is as you said i was there i was running to all the mountains and and tripping my way up to the mountains and and realizing that some of the craziest people i hate to put put it that way some of the, the craziest people are on that mountain man and when you get there, you have to, uh, learn how to protect yourself and be, be, wow, I'm trying to be kind, Stephen, as to some of the human behavior that is, ex- yeah. uh, that you see in that space that is called, uh, spirituality by people that yeah. are, um, children and haven't really experienced their journey. So here you are, you've yeah. gone through, man, because that is, a powerful story, uh, uh, Stephen, because I've been in that mud. Here you are, you realized. And uh, now how did you begin to incorporate some of those? Because you're learning as you're seeing all of this madness. You're still um, putting a few of the puzzles and pieces together. When you realized and you began to look at self, talk to me as to some of those Things that you had given permission, some of those thoughts that you'd given permission to grow that you now has to, you have to put aside and, and walk through them, the hurt, the pain, all of those things that you have, because you got to move from there now. How yeah. did you move, Stephen, from that when you recognize the shenanigans that they were, uh, putting you through and the name of spirituality and religion? So. There, I had a fundamental shift in the way that I that I saw my everyday life, and I started to become grateful. So I would say it was like about gratitude. It was like I had lost so much, or I thought I had lost so much there in terms of you know my my place with them and the family and and the the company and shares or money that I might have had. Like I thought that I lost so much, and what I realized is that is that the important thing was not, because then I was started, you know, I'm thinking about the future or I was thinking about the past. I started thinking about more of my, my being in the present and mm-hmm. every interaction that I was in and how I feel at every single moment. And I realized that if I could be happy in each moment with each interaction that I had with people, I became more calm. I became more more peaceful, less stressed. And started to think more about, um, or started to connect more with my present, whoever was in front of me, yes, whoever whoever I was with, and I started to to see at that point people who were genuinely enlightened. Mm-hmm. This is what I started to notice, and they were not necessarily people of any quote unquote great 
elevated state otherwise. I mean, they weren't necessarily rich or they weren't necessarily poor, or I would be able to to see people by the way they treated me. Yeah. And I had a fundamental shift right there. And what my realization there was that the way people treat me is the has to do with the relationship that they have with themselves. With themselves, yes. Mm-hmm. And I, I stopped to at least to a degree, or I reduced it. I, I stopped um, worrying about what people thought about me or um, – or I wouldn't take things as personally. Let me put it that way. When somebody mm. said something offensive or somebody misbehaved or some, I, I would see that more about this is how this person, this is the relationship that they have with themselves. And mm. then I could sort of let that go rather than becoming affected by it or being judgmental about it. And so for me, that changed who I decided to have relationships with. I wanted to have relationships with people who were good with themselves. Like yes. that, like so, the people who I would seek out in terms of my in terms of my association, those were the people. That was my criteria for choosing people that I wanted to spend time with. And I realized that I could surround myself with people who m- more with people who were good with themselves. And so that created, you know, I created around me a. I found a new business partner who was very much like that. He's somebody mm-hmm. who. At the core, and I could see that in him, and I, I could, and I, I worked for five years with him before, and I, you know, I have a very fine tuned meter now. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, this guy is really okay. Um, and um, I found a, a life partner, so I got, I got engaged, and I got married, and that's why I'm here in Cambodia. Uh, mm-hmm. She's, uh, she's from, and she's totally okay with herself. And so yeah. for me, that became my new criteria, and I would say also that. I became less aspirational about, yeah. you know, early on, I wanted to have a company and, you know, have the, be a unicorn and, uh, you know, go yeah. down that path of, of having a lot of material assets and whatnot. Um, as I was saying before, I started to become, India helped me in that, pro- in, in that way, just by having running water, mm-hmm. just by having electricity, just by not being persecuted, um, having Oh, good, good enough food on the table. All of these things became, um, that's, that was my new, what can I say? Like my new measurement, my new yeah. way of measuring contentment or happiness is to have a roof over my head. Do I have running water? Do I have electricity? And even in Cambodia where I am now, I don't always have that. In fact, during this, this call, the power cut, uh, yeah. at least once. And, um, there have been times where we've had no running water. I've had buckets filled up with with water and having to shower with them and flush the toilet with them and brush my teeth yeah. with them and wash clothes. So um, I don't have to fear that. I yeah. don't have to fear that. And when I do have even the smallest of these conveniences, um, that I'm grateful for that. Yeah. So so to me, that is the major shift of um, of what's important for me in life. Um, I can find my contentment with that. If I get more than that, it doesn't mean that I would reject it. Like if somebody yes. said, hey, come out yeah. with me to this really nice restaurant or you know, whatever it is, or here's a nice car, would you like it? It's not necessary that, that I would say, no, no, I, I'm opposed to that. Yeah. But I don't hanker for it. And if I yeah. don't have it, I'm not let down. I, I, I'm not um, displeased as a result of that. So to me, that's that's what I've gained. And yeah. I can just be sort of like I can be happy with just being normal, just being just being me. You you just laid out some of the most powerful um, tools that are necessary for one's personal the uh, the art of being present. It will bring you in a state of awareness that you will not believe. And as you stated, Stephen, as you began to live there. You began to notice certain things, certain revelations began to open up to you as you began to learn how to live within the present. Uh, the second thing you mentioned was as it moved you from there was the space of being contentment and, and in a space of uh, living in contentment. That is one of the most powerful places. A lot of people don't know how to stay there, um, how to manage themselves within that space. Uh, but it's a powerful space because there's much uh, um, no stress, not, not, not all the other angst. Um, it's not like you, like you said, it's not like you are not, uh, pushing forward to get to certain things. But at the moment, that space that you're in, you're content. You're not, um, you know, uh, you're not moved by all the other things. And, that, and I tell people, don't, uh, and I used to say this to girls and stuff like that. And people, 
Stop dating someone's potential and date them. And that's what we did, Stephen, when we went into this religious um, uh, uh, searching. We were <laughs> we were gravitating to their potential, but we weren't looking at what they were and what they really are. And when we began to look at what they really were and what they really are, it was horrifying because we realized we have just walked into the lion's den and these people have no heart, have nothing within them. You could see them as, once you began to um, come out of it and once you began to look at it from a different perspective, you realize you're standing in the middle of the lion's den. And it is a painful place to be because you realize that um, you could have died at any moment and thank God that you began to learn all of these things. But anyone that is listening to Stephen and I, this place right here that he talked about, being present in everything that you do will usher you into places that will bring you peace. It will usher you into places that will give you revelation. You will change your life right there because it is where we ought to be as we begin to move our, in our journey. And um, uh, uh, Stephen talked about here, he, he began to change his perspective. He met people of like mind. He began to notice their behavior as how they behave with themselves. And that's how you have to learn to judge people. Look at their behavior. Um, uh, I, I grew up in a church, um, Stephen, and I remember Jesus said, you're going to know those guys by their fruit, meaning their personality is going to show up. Don't worry about it. Just hang out a little minute and just watch it. And, and that's the case. So this man's story, um, guys who are listening to us, I want you to get in touch with Stephen. I want you to gravitate to him. Much wisdom, because I know we haven't even tapped into some of the things, because as I'm talking to him, I could um, I could see the deepness in him from where he has been and where he is today. You can see it from the man's face and that uh, from how he's speaking. And so I want you guys to get in touch with him, follow him, get into his podcast, listen to all of those things. He has several blogs and all these things. Grab anything this guy has. I learned to study because spending 21 years... <laughs> In mud, <laughs> you got some wisdom, bro. <laughs> because I, 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 you know, why I'm laughing, Steve, because I know exactly, yeah, what you were in, and oh, because I came from something similar. When, um, because when I got there, I thought I thought differently, and then when what was there was shocking, as uh, it stunned me for a while and took me a long time to recruit regroup and then I began to put my pieces together and, and mend mend ourselves. Um uh Stephen, I want to thank you for coming, man. It's almost an hour and we haven't even started yet. Yeah. And um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um I want to thank you guys. I want you to follow him. Uh feed your tiger. I love that. Um that's his yeah. uh podcast. And I want you guys to get in there and learn about your tiger. Uh learn about who you are learning about the strength that is you, the power that is you, your uniqueness. Um, go to someone who's been through those journey. He's been there in the mud for a while. He's familiar with what it is. And so he knows the questions to uh, have you ask so that you will get yourself out of those muddy situations and be able to come into the present and learn of who you are. Stephen, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Great chatting. Thanks.